Hi, and welcome to another Cello Circle Talk. In this talk, it wasn't live, it's all pre-recorded. So um, my friend Megan Tittenzer, who lives in Seattle, introduced me to Katie Plouts, who is an occupational therapist. I'll let her tell you more about what she does, but what we talk about in this video are the functions of the hand and very specific functions of the hand, how to avoid injury, and then we get into some, some details about the body as well. This was really informative for me, and so I hope that, that you enjoy it as well. So I'm a certified hand therapist. Um, so I'm an occupational therapist. Okay. Um, similar to PT, but more function. And um, when you're a hand specialist, you have to sit for some different boards and have a different amount of experience. I see. Um, yeah. Um, so I've worked in Boston and Massachusetts general for a number of years. And then I started my own practice. So I work with musicians one-on-one -on -one, and it's really fun. Oh my gosh. So this is great. So I just met with, um, the cardiovascular guy and he was looking over my, my records. He's like, wow, you have de Quer veins, carpal tunnel and cubital tunnel. He's like, and I know you're a musician. He's like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that all went away ish. But I have lots of questions about that too. I used to have a, a great hand therapist in town who also works with musicians, but I haven't, she retired and I haven't been able to get a hold of her because I've been wanting to talk to her about exactly what we're doing. Right. So this is, this is great. Oh. So, okay. I want to tell you her cello experience too. Yeah. So, and it's interesting because you're in Michigan. So I'm a Suzuki, first generation Suzuki kid. What year did you start Suzuki? What, how old were you? I was eight and I, it was the Haradas who came from Japan and started. Oh. Cool. And then. Um, my formative years, I studied with Richard Aaron. I love Richard. That was just such an awesome time. So and then I um, got a scholarship to a small college here to play my cello. Oh. And I just played way too much. I loved it. And then I ended up injured. And oh. that's how I got into what did you injure? Um, well, I had some inflammation and tendonitis on this side of my hand, the homer side. And I also um, were symptoms that weren't very specific on my left hand. Uh, but I also had a lot of tightness up here and um, yeah. I was amazed when I, before I got my posture peg, I have a posture peg. Um, yeah, they're great. And I, um, before I fixed that problem, I, I couldn't even, I was conducting a high school at the time. I, I couldn't even do this with my arm without it shooting pains. And I didn't realize just how much that spine alignment affects. I mean, of course, then when I thought about it later, of course it affects everything, but it was amazing just how much alignment does it. And, and then Later when I would do things, you know, with me and for my students too, I push here and then I just have students do this just a little bit and you push and all that power goes away yeah. or just a little twist and all that power goes away. And it's like, well, what do we think we're doing when we're like sitting at the cello or, you know, all of these things, it's so important. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've an exercise that I have people do sometimes uh, seated just to feel the difference. And it's different since we're sitting on the floor. But if you uh, flex your spine and let your head kind of hang forward the way it will, and then try to lift your arms and feel how that is. Yeah. And then if you then let your pelvis roll forward and feel how your spine lifts, so now your head is in alignment and now lift your arms. That's crazy. Yeah, so you feel the difference. <laughs> Oops, we can't hear you. We lost your sound. I have to mute myself because my daughter is like, gung, 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 gung. <laughs> like racing around. And also the static on my line is, is from my computer is really bad. Um, 
So you have the hips, um, you, you describe it as the hips rolling forward to get that lumbar curve then? And then just not to do it, not to arch the back, but just to allow that natural curve right. of the spine. And, you know, people talk about perfect alignment. Uh, and really, there, you don't want to find an alignment and just hold it. You need a dynamic um, a dynamic alignment. And you want to find, you know, there's a starting point where you're ready to go. You know how athletes when they're on the tennis court or whatever, they're kind of in this stance. Yeah, there. that ready pose. But I like to think of um, alignment more as like you've got a slinky dink and, you know, your pelvis tips back and you flex. Your pelvis rolls forward and you extend and it connects with the movement, the natural movement of your arms. Um, I have a I did a four year training in Feldenkrais. Uh, if you've ever heard of that motion, yeah. or Kreis, Feldenkrais. Uh, and that informs a lot of the, um, a lot of what I teach for supportive movement for the hand, because it's really all connected it's, and it starts at your feet. Yeah, so that's another thing. So I've, um... Oh, we're never even going to get to the hands, but I started standing and playing because I have, I don't know if you know, there's this strap that some of us use now to stand and play and it, it just attaches, um, you know, diagonally across your body and attaches to the cello and then you can stand. And what's great is my core is activated all the time because in order to hold the cello, I've got to, because the cello is resting against my chest and exerting force on my chest and I have to kind of... Um, Sorry, my computer gets static, I have to mute. But I, I have to kind of do this. And so I'm, I'm constantly in that active mode here. And my back is activated as a result because of that activation here. And then when I sit, I just feel like this lump of like, just yeah. lump of loose muscle. I have to try one of those. That's you should. It's, it's hard to tweak and get it to feel right. But the problem is what you were talking about that slinky dink kind of thing of that active movement of the spine. I'm always in, what's nice is my cello comes with me no matter where I go because it's attached to my body, but I can never adjust the way I'm addressed to my cello because it's attached to my body. You're sort of holding to support it in here. Exactly. And, and so what I don't, sorry, say that again. That's your thoracic spine and that's really where your arms start. So the bony connection of your arms is actually here at your sternoclavicular joint. So it's right right here is where your arms start. That's the bony wait, connection. Wait, now I've got my little muscle, man. I've got, wait, I'm gonna go grab my, my, skeleton, my skeletal chart. So, okay, so it starts, oh, oh, cause it, you mean that collarbone attaches? So if you feel your collarbone, uh, the clavicle, <laughs> Um, and you kind of move into your center, it attaches to your breastbone or sternum, and that's... What's really the mani manubrium? That's Is the that the sternum? Top, the top of the sternum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, look at that. And so the shoulder blade connects here. I knew mm -hmm. that, I guess. The shoulder blade is in the back, and it's attached by muscles. But uh, the bony connection via the um, clavicle or collarbone is in the front. And if you just are informed that that is the start of your arm, it changes the movement. So instead of thinking that it's all at your uh, ball and socket shoulder. That activates the back. It just, it changes how you move. It's your awareness of what is possible. Because we talk about um, often, you know, your finger doesn't stop here, it stops here. And that changes the activation of the fingers. But I never thought about that because that's, that's so cool. It does. Because when I think about playing from the back, which we talk about all the time, and no one knows what it means. When people say play from the back, what they mean is think of your arm to here and then move this whole shoulder girdle, which is attached yeah, and you know, I, if you were here, I could show you, but I can show on Megan, and I'm so glad you're here in person. 
it's not just the shoulder blade, but if you turn this way a little bit, um, sorry, here. Um, the shoulder blade right here, you can actually play from your thoracic spine because okay. your spine moves between them and it's connected. And if you're, if you're holding there, because you're maybe supporting your cello here or you're just tense um, or nervous, um, when you're holding here, you're not having that support to your fingers from your spine. So, so playing from your, how did you say it, Andrea? Playing from your back? Yeah. Even your spine. Then, so is that, are you talking about that, that um, latissimus, the trapezius muscle? I, when you say play from that spine, do you mean activate that muscle? No, not any particular isolated muscle. It's more thinking about um, the skeleton as a whole because people move in different ways and different habits and patterns uh, starting from, you know, being a baby. And, uh, you know, you think about a kindergartner in school starting to sit in a desk all day you st and then being stressed. You know, you hold yourself up, but you're also holding yourself together. And when you have that tension, that isolates your movement. So it's not so much about one movement because it, it or muscle, because everyone moves differently. Um, it, it's just people having the opportunity to know what they're doing and what their habits are so that they can move more connected and supportively to their hands. So when you're saying play from that point in your spine, you're just saying that just be aware of all the muscles that are involved to connect this point or the point on the tip of the, on the, at the contact of the bow through your arm, through your whole body, all the way to the spine. Yeah. And this, the thoracic spine is just an area if, um, here, um, an area that you don't necessarily connect to, uh, the sensory, uh, uh, the neurological kind of um, sensory component is not very uh, dense. Uh, so you don't have a lot of nerve endings telling you what's happening. So Megan, if you just kind of bring your bow up um, and move it around and notice where you feel it right now, um, and then if I press here on your thoracic spine. I feel something when you touch, but yeah. otherwise I'm not even aware of it. Right, so it, it, it sort of illuminates how this part of you can be connected. Um, and then, like Megan, I can show you. So for me, um, and I'm not sure how much this will show, but so here's my shoulder blade. Yeah. And you can see I'm moving from there. And then you can put your hand on my thoracic spine and feel how it's moving. But now see how I'm shifting oh, yeah. on my pelvis. Cool. And that would be for my feet. And, and you can just see how that um, supports and engages um, your whole body to um, come to your cello. Yeah, that's, the, that's another thing that when I'm standing... Okay, so when I'm sitting, I'm always trying to be connected to my feet, but I can't get around the fact that I'm um, just locked in by the fact that my my hips, my my pelvic bones are just on the chair, and I can I can change the way I adjust the chair, but I can't twist my right. I can't truly twist, and and so when I'm standing, there's I I can I cannot sit and replicate my bow arm when I'm as as I do when I'm standing when I'm standing my bow arm is um connected and free and and I I know when I'm pushing myself to my limits of physical limits but when I sit I don't know if it's habit or if it's accommodations but I'm doing something so is there that additional connection to those even those leg muscles, those all these strong muscles, these big muscles, is it going to change that too? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you've ever taken physics uh, and you think about all those little vector kind of arrows and um, the forces, there's a big free force that we can all use to play our cellos, and it's that arrow coming up from the floor 
into our into our feet into right our and and if you can start to feel how you can be connected to that that's how you're going to feel your feet more and then you're going to feel the connection through your ankles and your knees and into your hips and then into your pelvis and your spine and then your hands and your cello and this is what i got from richard that was the first time i heard someone say feel your feet and and i i don't know that he used these words but i use these words now and like let gravity act on your feet sink into the floor and take that energy and he would talk about bringing that energy into your chi take that energy from the ground that gravity he didn't say gravity but i say that and and in from your seat and sink into your seat and then you can let gravity act on you and then I feel like, and I'm, I'm saying this because I wonder if, if there's anything I should correct in my language. Anytime I tense up, I'm cutting off access to that gravity and that force, right? It's funny. It really is just an awareness thing. But when you can feel that, you know that you're over-recruiting your muscles and you can stop doing it. And um, you can feel, oh, this is my skeleton connecting, so I don't have to be tense in a certain area. Um, so it's funny, but just having that clarity of like your chi, you know, where that energy is or how you're connected to the floor and your seat is going to change how you use your muscles. So you can use less effort and be more free. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that's great. Okay. This is so great. <laughs> So excited. So the other thing I talk to my students about a lot is I just call them the W muscles because it's the easiest way to talk about it. And it's when your arms are in a W oh, yeah. and then bring them, your elbows down and down and down into the ground and whatever activates in your back, I have them keep that. And this is an overcompensation and I, I have them go back to more neutral later, but I have them over engage those muscles and I think that's that trapezius and latissimus like the the muscles that act on that shoulder blade all around the shoulder blade bring that shoulder blade down and then I have them with that still activated I have them take their bow in their hand and then completely um, tension free hold their bow so they're activating there and not here and then they just slowly we would just put the bow on the string and I say now let go of all your hand tension just so you you just want to hold the bow so you don't drop it and then pull those muscles down and then I have them make a sound and almost inevitably it's a better sound because they're not using these little muscles and trying to, to do it but then the and my question for you is then when I come back so from what I know about from the, my spine guy and you know people is that basically the spine and the back should be neutral but I wonder if you, but he's, he's um, not a, worked with musicians. He he's has worked with musicians, but not to the extent that you have, I think. But should the, should the muscles in the back and, this, and the arm be as neutral as possible? Or is there, as we play, that activation of the shoulder blades coming down um, to engage with the string a little bit? Yeah. Uh, um, so... I, you want to, part of having an, an, a, an alignment that's free to move any direction, if you think back to that slinky dink, um, is you don't want these muscles in the front tight. And those these are the tense muscles where you're like trying way too hard. Um, so having an awareness of those muscles in the back is helpful. Um, and you can hear the difference, absolutely. Oh, because if these contract, you're going to come in. Yeah. Oh, I never even thought, because I feel like I, because obviously these muscles are moving. So I feel like that's, an, so sometimes I've told students to activate here, but actually that will cause them to roll in, wouldn't it? Well, it really depends on the, the individual. And, um, you know, there may be some people who need to be more aware of activating here. Um, but it is a balance of the the muscle groups so for some people if you're just really t tight and over um, worked here you're going to 
need to do that W exercise and feel back here. Yeah. And so it really, everyone has their own pattern and habit of where they're more active and where they're more relaxed. Uh, and how, how much they're aware of that is a really big part of it. Because if you don't know that you're tight here and that you're using these muscles all the time and your brain is just hearing that message again and again, this muscle's engaged, you stop being aware of it and then you can't change it. So it's really more about having that awareness that you're giving your students by saying, oh, you need to activate here or here are your W muscles. Um, and then you can ha let let go of them when you need to or engage um, and just have that balanced, um, more fluid movement. I feel like that's why I have to focus on those W muscles with those back muscles more because everyone does this. Because there's this thing we have to get around. So everyone wants to get around it as opposed to, you know, I want them to look the way they do when they're walking down the street and playing in the playground and then address the cello, but then everyone wants to change their structure, right? So what circumstances would would you see in a cellist where you do want them to activate from the front side? Um, I, you know, Andre, you sort of gestured here in this area. Um, and to me, if a student is really isolating in that ball and socket joint, um, I, that's an area with your rotator cuff where you can, you know, if you're holding back to have this alignment, but then only using the uh, glenohumeral joint, um, you could hurt yourself and you're not going to get a good sound. But if you activate a little bit more this way in here, and that can come from your shoulder blade also, and even your spine. So it's more like this. So I'm not moving my, this is glenohumeral joint like this. And now I'm not gonna move that. I'm only moving from my spine and my shoulder blade. So so that's where you would end. I never noticed how much this moves <laughs> until yes. just now. Yes. Like that really does move. I mean, of course it moves, but not of course. That moves a lot more than I th thought that it would. <gasps> that's crazy. Well, and then if you come back to flexing your spine and then extending it, Feel how that can, you can move that part of your arm, which starts at your clavicle oh. and your ubrium or your sternum. It's like you oiled my joints. Right? Because I have trouble dropping at the frog all the way. It's a thing that I do. I'm like constantly here because I think that I'm dropping from here. But when I drop from here, because what happens is it aligns everything on the back and the front side. It's all one unit. Yes. Yes, and you know, it's so funny. I was, um, we found an old, um, I'm just gonna take this off so I can, um, you guys can see my arm throttle. But um, my husband and I were clearing off an old device yesterday and we found some images, some video footage of my daughter playing when she was in second grade um, for a talent show. Oh my goodness, so cute. <laughs> but she sat down and, you know, she, oh, I'm so proud of her. <laughs> she looked so great. And then she got the introduction on the piano and she goes like this because she was nervous. Yeah. I mean, that right there is going to take you out of this movement here. Right. And common. And, and, and it's not even bad. Like when we're going to be our best, we need to be excited. We need to be um, a little bit nervous. Um, but if we don't know that we're bringing our shoulders like that. Right. Um, it's when we're small and then we you know we carried our whole lives yeah yeah okay so <laughs> Megan and you of course you can chime in anytime it's like right <laughs> I feel like oh, just talk I can't stop asking questions I'm so excited okay so then um the arm okay well the already just your idea that everything just the awareness it kind of changes everything just to be aware and let everything be flexible actually answers a lot of questions that I have. Okay, so maybe if we can talk about the hand. Yeah, uh, So and, and this is a real challenge for our teachers because anatomy varies from person to person. 
And what's possible for one kid is not possible for another, or it's super complicated. Right. And that's something I ran into that sort of let me know that I I couldn't continue on the trajectory that I wanted to with cello because I had stuff I needed to, fi to figure out with my thumb. So we can just, let's do the, let's talk thumb. Okay. Let's all look at our thumbs. So, um, and right versus left is really interesting too. So if you make an O, and let's let's start with our left hand like Andrea. Okay. Um, and then you squeeze. Yeah. And then just rotate a little bit so I can see. Okay, that's beautiful. Okay. And so this is a, Megan's is a little bit different. And then you can see mine and I'll do two things. I'll be the demo. So, okay. So this is what Andrea is doing and it's really nice and curved. Yeah, I've really worked at strengthening that. That used to not happen. So this is a thing that you'll see. And that's because of hypermobility uh, and awareness of the muscles that you're using. So the muscle that bends this joint is right here. It's a small muscle in the hand. It's called the flexor pollicis brevis. Yes. It's probably one of my favorite muscles in the whole body because it's so important and it makes such a difference for the thumb. It would be right here? Yeah. So, oh, I see. Yeah. And then the other two are here then? No, no. There are two other muscles there, um, but it's sort of a, a just a, a different direction. So the muscle okay. that bends this joint that's farther down is in your forearm. What? A really long muscle, and it's easy for kids and for anyone to connect to because it's got a bigger representation on your cortex. Oh, that makes sense with my trigger because I had trigger finger. Uh -huh. And when you, when you isolate here and you move here, you can – it's because it's going here and it's not going that oh if you even resist this you can feel it in your forearm so it's much easier it's like you know your biceps you can easily feel oh here i am i'm using this muscle and engage it but when right tiny muscles in the hand they're much harder to connect to they have a smaller representation on the cortex <gasps> unless you use them a lot which is why thumb position on the D string is not where we should start, which is where most people start. It should be on the A string because when we push here, we're using this joint. And when we push here, we have to activate that big, long thing, which must be harder to control, right? Yes. <gasps> so, um, okay. And I haven't thought about it that way before. But um, so when you're teaching thumb position, it's really about this muscle. Yes. You want this joint to be straighter, right? Right. Yeah. And this this muscle, the flexor pollicis brevis, FPV, my best friend, <laughs> is going to give you the stability. So so that you're not like I when I was learning thumb position, my thumb would go back and forth like this. It was so unstable, and I didn't know how to get stability there. Right. Exactly. That's a problem with so many cellists. Mr. Starker told me I'd never be a cellist because of that. I was like, jerk. Yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> I just call Mr. Starker a jerk. Oh, that's, that's not, I didn't mean that, but I, I felt it at the time. So flexor pollicis brevis. Oh, I see. I see. What is abductor and flexor? Can you just give me some basic anatomy lesson? Uh, so, okay. Um, are you referring to the other muscles on the page? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. So sometimes it says abductor pollicis. So the abductor, the abductor, AB, opens this area. And you want that. You need the C. Oh, I see. Curve. You don't want to be like that. That's another question. Do we want to see or do we want it to be like this? It, anywhere between that, you just don't want a collapse of these joints. Okay. Oh, so many questions. Yeah. I can't even keep them. So I should take notes on all my questions as they come up. When, when a person, when a, a cellist is looking for stability, or, or anyone, an athlete, uh, someone sitting at a desk, uh, when you have hypermobility, sometimes it feels stable to hang at the end of a joint, um, just on, on those ligaments. But 
you get locked in there and then you have to work your muscles harder and it's bad for your joints. So that's why you always want this nice rounded, right. it's longitudinal arch. I see. Okay. So, um, when I, uh, okay. If I have students that can do this, but then collapse here, then for a while I allow this, this, this goes into still as a pill bug. Actually, this is exactly what the still as a pill bug question I have for you is. I um, allow this in order to curve the pinky. I'll allow this to go straight because that's the only way they can curve their pinky. And they'll be on the, even sometimes on the wrong side of their pinky, um, very much so, just to get these to curve. And then as we come back, and then they've gained some strength to bend these joints, then I come back and readdress mm -hmm. this. Is that a problem? So oh, your intuition is right on because we're talking about two muscle groups here. So um, so sort of moving on from the FPB, the flexor pollicis brevis and our thumb conversation. Um, when you are moving your fingers, there are your extrinsic uh, muscles, your flexors that go like this, um, and then your extensors that straighten. Uh, and then in your hand, in your palm, are these intrinsic muscles. And they're the ones that, if you isolate, they basically do this sort of duck position, duck bill. Um, and you need both. Once again, these are harder to access because they're small muscles. Oh, you mean bending from here or bending from here? I, yeah. I see. Different muscles. Um, so the muscles that do this give you stability and are sort of postural muscles. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the muscles that are moving your fingers um, and isolating the movement more are in your forearm. Can I just double check on a, a very basic thing? So muscles attached to the tendons that move the bones, is that right? Yes. So in order to move the bone... I have to move the tendon first, and that's activated by the muscle, right? Is it? Just making sure. Okay, just making... I thought that was a very important... oh, Sorry, dog. Oh, my dog was under my foot, <laughs> which was in the air. You know, while we're talking about it, the tendons are really more work inflammation because the muscle bellies, they have a bigger surface area. They, they're contractile. They're contracting and relaxing. Um, versus the tendons, they're sliding through these nooks and crannies, and it's um, they've got sheaths over them and pulleys, and and they're more prone to rub, and that's where you get the inflammation. So you'll like right in here around the wrist, and then in the fingers are where you might feel um, discomfort because of tendons. So then you could strengthen this muscle and then strengthen this muscle and that could be separate. And then eventually when we play, they're all doing things in concert with each other. Yeah, and it's interesting. Uh, when you talk about postural muscles, these little ones in the hand, they go neurologically, they connect to the rest of your movement. So if you're really scrunched over like this and you know, you've got this going on with your neck and, you know, <laughs> not where we want to be, you're, you're not going to be engaging these postural muscles here. Um, uh, you, it's a funny thing, but, um, and I'm trying to think, uh, I haven't talked about this for a little bit, but depending on whether you're more flexed in your spine, like flexed versus extended, uh, it's going to be, it's going to change how you are able to feel these muscles. So flex and extend. Yeah. So a lot of the time people who are really extended will be more in this position in their fingers. Um, and then if you're super flexed, that's just not great for anything. Uh, but if you can sort of dip your pelvis back a little bit so that your the small of your back isn't as curved this way, that's going to help you engage these fingers. So the, these intrinsic muscles, and this is a really subtle thing, but um, it just the point is that it's not just right here, it's really connected to your whole body. So that's incredible. 
who's having a hard time on um, think you know they're kind of collapsing at small finger right like this to exaggerate it yeah it may be because they're really holding in their lumbar spine and if you just come behind and give them just like a little contact there it can illuminate um that tension and help them let go of it and oh my gosh it could change here so amit pellet is this um, great cellist and he teaches at a university and conservatory and uh, he talks a lot about just who huh, about like really going into that lumbar and do you think that that I, I think that his almost goes straight his the back low his lower back is almost like filled in but do you think that that he might like that would create that connection to the to the inside of the hand then it absolutely could and um, it can uh, pull a person out of that pattern of extension and kind of tightness um, in the low back. And, and that's the lumbar spine is an area where people really hold. They're working it all the time and it's a block so that you're not moving freely and connecting the support from your feet up to your hands. So then, and then to over, to, to have the natural curvature of that, of, of that lumbar, area um would just in a neutral position um as opposed to kind of like a little filled in or i don't know how you would describe that as as you understand for playing cello it'd be better to have that constantly engaged or again just moving when you need it and when you feel like you want more power you can sink into your chair and feel that fill in yeah, you really want to be able to, you don't want that to be blocked. So if you're holding there. Yeah, that's an, okay, that's what I meant. Going to decrease the support to your arms and the connection of strength from your feet. Uh, and I could, I could really get into that. Um, but part of it when you're seated is thinking about your sit bones. Um, you know, those bony prominences. And that's where you can really feel that there's, you can move around on that. And it can, like, even just sitting here, you, can, you know, you, you feel that, Andrea, how when you're on your bones, it's a tipping point, it's a balancing point. If you roll back and fill out your lumbar spine too much, then you don't feel your sit bones and you can't move. But if you're too far forward, you're sort of locked in all that extension and it can be a strain and a block that way. So what you were describing with that cellist, softening the lumbar spine and kind of coming back, that's, I, that sounds really good. That's, oh, that's great. Help free that area and soften it and connect it to the rest of you so that your feet can help your hands. That's so cool. Okay, thumbs. <laughs> I'll let you go back. This all came from thumbs, didn't it? Yeah. So I'll let you go back to thumb. <laughs> so, okay, yeah. So we started by looking at this with the right hand, um, or no, with the left hand. Um, and, you know, that gets complicated when you're in thumb position. And just, you know, this is the alignment, the longitudinal curve that you want, a little bit of flexion at both joints, you know, you don't want to be hyperextended there. Right. Um, and you're going to see so much variability from student to student. And I think hypermobility in the hands is getting worse for kids because they're in front of screens all the time. And you need that playground time where you, you're using the rest of you. Um, so um, if you go to the bow hand um, and my daughter's teacher called this the, the doorbell. <laughs> right. um, so you're going to want more of a curve at this joint, at the end joint. Yeah. But, um, so if we cur if if you squeeze really hard here, for me, I don't have that collapse because my whole life, pretty much, I've been playing the cello and had that bent curve thumb. So you might feel the difference here. But again, remember, for kids who are having a hard time with this, um, bending too much at this joint, they need to engage this muscle, the flexor pulsus brevis, in the thumb. Right here is where it is. 
versus kids who are doing this need to engage their long muscle. And even just blocking the joint and letting them feel the difference and kind of holding against it. So if you push against me, Megan, oh. yeah, I feel how it's down there versus if you relax and bend here, so hold this open. Oops, sorry. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's tricky. So I'm isolating the intrinsic mm-hmm. with flexor pulsus brevis. So if you flex at this point and hold, now you feel that there. Yeah. And um, I, you can use tape to help kids feel the difference, just scotch tape. Um, just putting some tape on the back here or around the joint. Oh, around the joint, so they move the whole, the whole unit like this? If they're bending too much here, you can tape around it. And, and that sensory component, engaging the, cu- the cutaneous receptors around on the skin, will help build an awareness of how they're moving the joint. Um, there's so many little tricks that you can do. Um, and I always joke with my patients, I'm like, we're going to do this really fancy bio feedback. Here's your scotch tape. <laughs> but it, it works. It totally works. So um, this joint here, I actually usually think about this joint and having it not do this because that's what usually happens. But I, I don't think I'm as aware of this joint in the bow hand. But, well, so the way that I talk about the bow hand is to let the thumb be as slack as possible so that this flexor pollicis brevis muscle you're talking about is as relaxed, as squishy as possible. I've actually recently changed the doorbell from doing this to doing this and feeling like it's soft and squishy in here. But I wonder if that is... I wonder what you would think even for... Because you have a kid and you play the child. Would it be better to feel like this is flexible or like this is soft i you really want both and it depends on the kid because you know yeah for the kids that are doing this um you're absolutely right this needs to be soft and squishy but the kids that have this pattern it they need the door the doorbell here but for the kids that are doing this if they can only transfer that to, to this hand for thumb position, if they're having a hard time with it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Knowing the difference between the long flexor for this joint and the intrinsic little flexor in the hand here, the flexor pollicis brevis, that is going to inform how you teach kids, whether it's their bow hand or their thumb position. Uh, and that's, you know, when I, when I figured that out, it was like, oh my goodness, my, you know, an epiphany is so exciting, but, but at the same time, it, it's a real challenge to engage and strengthen and change your patterns and your habits, uh, to use these muscles the way that they'll benefit you best. Um, you have to be motivated. <laughs> yeah, right. Because it's so like okay. So to strengthen to strengthen this the the long um, connection here, what mm-hmm. I sometimes have students do is put this knuckle right up against here, mm-hmm. and then push their thumb on the D string, mm-hmm. so that they feel the connection to the elbow, like it's one line, you know. Wow. So that. And that is not doing them a disservice, right? Because some of them can't feel it like this. So sometimes I've had them do a fist like this and try to push on the, well, I'll do fist and try to push on the A string here so that they feel, and I think actually maybe that's why that feels good because I'm activate when I do a fist, I'm activating in here. And if this, if this is needing that, that's probably getting some of that sensory awareness in there. I, I love that strategy. And so what you're doing is you're supporting the joints in the alignment that you want. But then at the same time, when you engage that muscle, feel how the fingertips are in contact with the line of that muscle. So you're getting that sensory feedback at the same time. So that, I love that strategy. That's great. That's I, I'm great. Hello, more, and I want to work up the um, prelude to the third movement and the top of the second page. And and I'm um, I just I haven't played consistently or much for the last twenty some years. 
Um, but that that's when I'm going to totally rebuild my thumb position. Right, right. <laughs> Last fall. But um, yeah, that um, that's a great strategy. That's hard because your thumb is marooned back there. And if you happen to have short fingers, then your thumb has no support in first position. Yeah, and and so um, kind of where I was going with this, and, and like you just said, is um, when you know you're down on the lower strings, if you can find this position, and this is what I would do, um, maybe just that bass note, play that, and feel your shoulder blade. Feel how you can let your thoracic spine go because you need, you you can't, I mean, you could just hold this still and, and come down and f pull your arm to the lower string, or you could let your spine curve and let that support your arm up and then bring it back. So finding that foundation and conditioning that way proximally, you know, more toward your core. And, and then once you've got that foundation, opening it and, and coming to the other notes. Yeah. Really good strategy. I'm totally going to get on so many tangents, but when we play scales, da 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 da. Generally, we we go like this. We we, we release and we kind of like you know bounce ish into the into new positions. We release the weight. When we come back, oftentimes the accuracy isn't there like it is going forward, and I wonder going forward if there's a a freedom of release happening all the way. through through everything you know that we've been talking about here and here that goes forward that does it need a different kind of activation when you come back to reseat everything where you need it to be to be balanced because i feel like all intonation problems once you've played something in tune once or twice i feel like it's a balance problem it's not an ear problem people think i need to train my fingers i need to train my ears i just think no you're just out of balance so i, I feel like if someone's having trouble yeah da 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 and it's all out of tune going like a lot of my students, me included, when we go forward in tune and on the way back out of tune, but what's happening on the downward slide well, from upper positions back to like fourth position? Um, that is so interesting. And I think you're totally onto something with that. So, uh, and I'm coming, I'm thinking back to the support that you have from the rest of your body. And when you're, when you're moving forward and um, up the scale, there's, it's like, it's almost like this winding up from the rest of you uh, versus the releasing. And once you kind of engage a muscle and it's on and you're doing, you know, you're moving and, and kind of tensed up to that point, I think it's harder to, re it is harder to release it and harder to be aware of that. And that is, that's another thing just with movement awareness. Uh, it's, it's really easy to say, okay, I'm going to engage this muscle and I'm going to do this because we're all about doing. Um, but if you're really going to play uh, beyond a certain level and um, not wear yourself out, you also have to be able to release each muscle so um you know it's kind of the maybe this just comes to me like a trampoline that kind of movement instead yeah. of on go 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 it's more of that springy kind of on and off um but you know if you're getting all tense here as you're coming up the scale um it's almost like you're lifting up each stair behind you and then you have to, when you turn around to go down, you have to get each stair, each step back in place. Uh, so learn to come up without this tightening here. It seems like that would help you release and come down with the support, um, if that makes sense. That makes sense. I think there is some kind of, when I go up, there isn't... Um something building up in here. That's so fascinating. I'm going to have to, I'm going to practice tonight. It starts at your feet. It starts at your feet. So awesome. <laughs> so great. Okay. So let's see. We have about maybe. Yeah. What do you have time for? I have time. I don't know. Kate, how much time do you have? Uh, I, 
I, maybe 10 or 15 more minutes. Okay, great. Um, so, oh, okay. One thing I want to say about the pinky, um, yes. that's important. <laughs> and this came up when we were talking to Olympics. I'm so yes. sorry. I'm okay with this. <laughs> He's a cello <laughs> dog. So cute. <laughs> He knows um, my dog well. <laughs> so, um, you know, if again, if we go right versus left, so here I am pressing really hard, and and I'm pretty good now on my left, on my right too. But I used to collapse, and I used to demonstrate this. So, you know, the kids who get a collapse at that joint. Yes. Um. So part of what's going on there is the position of this joint also. So it's the intrinsics that duck bill versus the extrinsics, yes. your, these, these joints, the long flexors. So there's an, a very common anatomic difference. Um, and Megan, <laughs> this is perfect because we've got both. So for me- This and, thing, this thing, right? Y yeah, something like, like that. What is that? How, why is it different in everybody? Yes. So Can you there, do that, Megan? So there are two sets of- flexor muscles. There's a superficial set, the flexor digitorum superficialis, and then there's the profundus, which is underneath it. So the profundus goes to each fingertip and, and bends at this joint. That's your profundus. It's only one muscle belly. So to have the more isolated and independent movement for each finger, you need the superficialis. So the superficialis, if you hold these fingers straight and then you bend like, it'll automatically, you'll bend like this if you're holding the other finger straight. Um, and that bends this joint and they each, each finger has its own independent muscle belly and tendon. So, um, except for the small finger. So if you, you know, with one student, you might, let's see how I can do this. Um, this is that okay, Megan? Yeah. Okay. So one student, you're you're gonna have them bend here, bend here. Good. And and it's cool when you bend at that joint, you can feel it's all wiggly at the end joint because you're isolating. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you know it's relaxed and that's good. Uh, okay. And then bend here on your ring finger, Megan. And then look, she can bend there on her small finger. So then there are people like me. So I can do my index. Yeah, I can't do that. My second finger. I can do my ring finger and then I get to my small. I, I cannot bend at that middle joint. It's, so the tendon is not independent. The muscle belly isn't independent and it can be, a, you know, it can be totally connected. <laughs> there you go, Dan Winston. Or it can be partially connected. It could be more at the muscle belly. It could be more in the tendon. It's the variability um, is just great. I yeah. have this thing that I do. It's one of the advanced Chilympic events, and it's um, yoga fingers. So we play a finger, and then we just check for looseness in all the other fingers. And when we get to third and fourth finger, you know, it's it's very hard because things are connected. And third finger, it's really hard for some people to release here. But for some students, they could have their third finger down, and they're or they're – yeah, their third finger especially, and their other fingers are completely loose, like 10 on a scale of 10. Whereas some of us who are very good on other fingers, and I can't do it, is it because of those connections that some people are just wired differently? So yes and no. I think for people who do have the tendinous connections, um, you know, there's, you could say an evolutionary advantage to having more strength and stability. Uh, but you don't have that independence. Um, but I think part of it can, you know, awareness is a big thing, but part of it can even be personality. So maybe you're a really hard worker, Andrea. I'm tense. <laughs> you're really hard. I'm a hard worker. And I've been, you know, I worked so hard on cello and I practiced so much when I was a kid, especially in high school. And then you get that tenseness and you don't get the independent freedom. You know, I wonder if those students that are able to do that are swimmers or, you know, they're just not practicing as much. I don't yeah, I wonder that too. How much is just learned environment? How much is anat anatomical? Levels, family, life stressors. It, 
it, it could be a lot of different things. Right. Oh, that's so interesting. For better or worse. Okay, so before you have to go, um, still as a pill bug. <laughs> so what I do for this, so I, um, I, this I love, and I love that you love it. It makes me feel even better about Slide the Slug, that you think that this is a good motion. <laughs> the problem that I have, uh, okay, so brush stroke. When you're doing brush stroke, your bow is coming off the string. And generally, I don't have my students hold their bow horizontally in the air because you have to squeeze. You know, here you can hold with, like it's a feather. And mm -hmm. here you've got to squeeze because you've got all this weight exerting force on your pinky. But I feel like it's the pinky that's controlling the tip of the bow because it's farthest from the fulcrum. Mm -hmm. So th I, I, my brush stroke is, um, so that it goes horizontally, everything is horizontal, and none of this like jostling of the tip out of control from the pinky. And and the way I hold my bow, some people might hold it here, but I hold on the side, and I just feel this kind of stickiness here. I'm experimenting with a, a rubber thing here, but I normally don't have that. But that this is here. So, and then what I found is that students will oftentimes do this because they don't have that strength. Oh, well now that I know that this goes down into the arm, yeah, and, and that it's separate from that. Yeah, so that's your, um, that's an intrinsic muscle. So that's your hypothenar eminence, and that's your um, flexor digiti minimi. So if you can get kids to try and work on this, and this can be really hard for kids to find this position, but that's a different muscle group. That's hard for kids? It, it can be, and you need to make sure that the wrist is free. Mm. Okay. <gasps> Yeah. Okay, but so yeah. The, yes. Oh, so I should check for looseness. Of course, that makes sense. So what I have them do here is this is where I want them to be, where that's bend, bend, bend at three spots. And then if they can't do it, like if that's hard, what I have them do is is minimize this distance between this joint and the stick, so that they come in here like this, so that. And now what I know from what we talked about before, and, and then they and then they work at curving this joint and or this joint, whatever joint they're having trouble curving. And then they just sit here and they might do this and their thumb might be completely collapsed in here. But all we're working on is strengthening these two joints. Mm -hmm. Is this dangerous? Can I injure someone's hand from this? No. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and what you're really building, there, there are two types of strength. There's the strength of your muscle tissues, but there's also the strength of the neural connection and the awareness that you have so that you can say, this muscle, go. And that's, you're teaching those muscles how to do that. Um, and is, that is that a foot? <laughs> I try this myself. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, and just knowing that these are your long flexors that bend these two joints and that kids who don't have independent um, motion at this joint are going to have a harder time. Oh, that's so fascinating. Oh, my so gosh. Yeah, so there may be some kids where they just can't do it. And yes. Like they don't have a muscle working I, at just that joint, they're connected. So some kids would not be able to do this. Yeah, well, and it's interesting. I So for me and my anatomy, and I'm just trying this, and I haven't tried this exercise specifically before, and I'm not like really conditioned. I'm playing a lot. But do you see how I'm trying to do, I'm trying to, do you see how I have that little collapse? Yeah, so what I would tell you is to just bring this joint next to the stick of the bow. Yes, and now you're going, so here it was the intrinsic muscle. And yes, and now, yeah, oh, yeah, so this is totally slack, so we're not doing anything here. And and then I never thought to check for looseness of the wrist because that is going to be something to, so, and, and that's hard because when you do this, your wrist bends. There's no way to really... It's really hard to keep it straight, but I think that that's going to have to, it'll just have to come over this way a little bit. So when my wrist is more bent, I have more of that position. And when I'm more extended, 
I'm more flexed at the fingers. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the time the wrist position can be the key. And you see that in the left hand too. Um, you know, when you've got this versus this. Yeah. What about those students who, when they do lock out a joint and they complain that there's like pain or it's like stuck, locked yeah. out, you know, and they have to like, right. They have to like throw it out of alignment to get it loose again. Yeah. What do we do with those students that are um, like working through this? So you really, for those students, it's really important to maintain this longitudinal curve, which is the little bend at each joint. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the time, this base joint is the key for that okay. and the wrist position. So mm -hmm. look at that. But, you know, um, earlier I mentioned how there is stability when you're at the end of a joint range, mm -hmm. but you can get locked in mm -hmm. and then you can't move out of it. Uh, so that's just why we need to make sure that we engage in that curved position that's going to allow you to move and that we start curved and don't try to get to curved right because if we start here it's going to lock if we start like this then it won't lock right and then we can eventually go out and if it and then if it locks on the way out then that's our limit right yeah and then um for kids who say they have pain uh that's you, you definitely don't want to keep doing anything that causes pain so um i look at the wrist mm -hmm. um, and and maybe try to get them to relax more because if you're oh. pushing yourself to the end of a joint a lot of the time it's because you're tense uh, and and kids might have hypermobility and there might be tendons sliding on the back of the finger and and they're you know if it's a long-term issue have them see a hand therapist mm -hmm. because um, they it may be that they could just wear a splint or something that would help um, or they need to do some more specific strengthening. Do you have to go or is there time for one more question? I okay, think you have to go. Oh, okay. okay, so um, a four-year-old hand, a six-year-old hand, an eight-year-old hand, what's the difference? Oh yeah, um, so kids are just floppy. I mean, I, I don't know that I can add anything that you haven't seen. Um, I mean, it's in one way it's good. I think developmentally, you, you could talk about hand, um, but one of the big changes is um, a ability to differentiate between right and left. When kids are small, they're just, it, you know, you see it, you get this arm up and then this arm's up, and then you get this arm down, but this one comes down. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's going to change over time, and that's a neurological change. Um, but um, yeah, I think younger kids, it's such an opportunity for them to learn the difference and start building the strength in their intrinsics. Uh, just because I don't think there are a lot of opportunities for kids to learn that. Um, and then, you know, as you get older, um, I mean, I just think about how when you're a baby, you're pretty much all cartilage. And then as you get older, you've got your um, bones, but you also have more length. So the levers are different. Um, you know, you think of those squishy fat hands versus the um, long, more skinny fingers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, is there anything specific? Like, no, I was just wondering if I need to worry about about anything in particular but it sounds like what you're saying is what i know just anecdotally you know yeah and i think for kids that start young it's such an opportunity to set them up connecting to their feet and feeling their sit bones and feeling that they can be a slinky dink yeah. um, and then feeling the curves in their fingers and differentiating this versus this the extrinsics versus the intrinsics. See, this is this is really new for me. That's great. Yeah, and the, and this then being able to differentiate um, that. So here you're doing your intrinsics this in the hand, but then here I'm moving through the tendons that are extrinsic. So it's like um, I'm able to let go to a certain point here in my wrist.
I didn't realize I have, re I've been working on my basement. I'm like, I have reduced mobility on this side. <laughs> I'm like, I injured myself doing something. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is so nice of you to go to the end of your free time. I just so appreciate this. That was so fun. I love so talking helpful. about this. And, it, you know, it's always been a goal. It's funny how we have these goals and then life just happens. But I really um, I just love the idea of helping musicians uh, who aren't injured and teachers have a better, clearer idea of what is possible and how to do pitfalls and then how to just find that connected movement that starts at the floor and the support that goes all the way up and that freedom to engage their cellos to make beautiful music and that to be the focus, not like tension or stress. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. And Megan, thank you for connecting us. Okay, so, um, well, until next time, I guess. <laughs> yes, hey. sounds good. Okay, thank you. Bye, Andrea. Bye. Bye.